All right, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Let me acknowledge and thank uh, Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Commissioner Rosa Escareno, um, who's here with us today, and for her hard work on one of the measures that was introduced uh, in City Council uh, earlier today. Um, today, uh, two actions were taken in City Council uh, to improve the quality of life um, in our city and further ensure the safety of some of our most vulnerable residents. First and foremost, the City Council passed an ordinance that will improve our city's air quality by requiring more intensive review before air polluting businesses uh, can build new facilities. This effort, as many of you know, has been long in the making and as a result of a lot of consultation with a range of stakeholders, uh, it, will, it will put our city on the right track to fully ensuring that our residents have clean air no matter what zip code in which they reside. The ordinance is comprised of several reform uh, efforts, including extended planned uh, development oversight uh, for major industrial developments, requiring that businesses such as intensive manufacturers, recyclers, and freight and logistics facilities undergo universal site plan review, uh, including an air impact assessment and a transportation analysis, as well as a period for public comment before being approved uh, to open a facility, and all re requiring all new industrial developments to be subject to the sustainable development policy, paving the way for the expanded adoption of sustainability measures such as uh, EV charging stations, on-site renewable energy, and green roofs. These five substantive requirements are all intended to build a regulatory infrastructure that puts us on a better path to cleaner air across Chicago with public input engagement on the front end. Um, yes, the ordinance is different uh, than originally introduced, but I would say as a result of the extensive consultation and engagement, it is better. This ordinance is a direct result of the hard work of many, uh, including <clears throat> environmentalists, uh, industry groups, and elected officials coming to the table to strike the right balance between environmental equity and industrial development. And I want to personally thank uh, many people who were instrumental in getting this organization over the th or this ordinance over the threshold uh, and getting passed today. Let me start by recognizing Alderman Garza and Alderman Thompson. I also want to thank um, Floor Leader Michelle Harris and Deputy Floor Leader um, George Cardenas in particular, who spent a significant amount of time listening to his uh, colleagues and making sure that we are on the right path to be able to get something done for our residents. And of course, I want to thank Zoning Committee Chair Tom Tunney uh, for all of his efforts um, in making sure that this ordinance um, got uh, to a favorable committee vote and onto the floor and helping take this latest step on our path toward a more sustainable and environmentally equitable Chicago. No resident, no matter what neighborhood they live in, should ever be forced to live with the fear that the air that they are breathing isn't safe. This ordinance addresses um, not only this concern and gives residents a meaningful and necessary voice in the placement of manufacturing facilities in residential neighborhoods. This is important um, and gives more power to the community but it also will help create an economy that works for all residents and puts our city on a path towards equitable and inclusive growth. The second measure that I want to highlight uh, was introduced um, by the, my administration today and will advance our economic growth efforts. This measure, known as the Vaccine Anti-Retaliation Ordinance, will significantly enhance our workers' safety as we journey towards our post-COVID period of recovery. The ordinance, which aligns with our efforts to push vaccines to residents who need them most and builds on the anti-retaliation ordinance we launched last May to protect workers uh, who are sick with COVID-19, prohibits employers from retaliating against those employees who take time off to get vaccinated. As Com Commissioner Escarena will explain in more detail in a moment, Employers will face consequences such as fines of 1,000 or 5,000 if they violate this particular ordinance. And through civil action, workers may be able to uh, be reinstated to the same position they held before any retaliatory action was taken. Given the urgent need to protect our workers and our residents, this ordinance will take effect immediately upon passage. But the bottom line here, folks, is this. We have an urgent need to make sure that our residents are safe. 
And for those who are following the public health guidance, there should be no action by an employer that retaliates or otherwise impinges upon their rights of work. Whether it's staying home because they are sick, abiding by other social distancing and masking requirements, or taking time to get a necessary life-saving vaccine. In Chicago, we will protect those workers. A key part of that work is increasing protections for our workers who have been serving our city in essential roles and have played a critical role in our ability to open up. Their workplaces should be the last place that they should face any barriers to stepping up and doing their part to protect Chicago by getting the life-saving vaccine. Additionally, this ordinance is a direct result of the hard work of the Protecting Workers Working Group, uh, which I stood up last fall. This working group brings agencies at all levels of government together with community-based organizations to advise the city on how to address industries such as domestic work that are ripe for exploitation or human trafficking. And thanks to their recommendations, we've been able to launch initiatives like Your Home is Someone's Workplace to protect domestic workers and really elevate the work that they do every single day. And these workers are primarily black and brown women of color. We need to make sure that they are protected from exploitation and ensure that they are treated as the professionals that they are. And now um, the introduction of legislation like the uh, vaccine anti-retaliation ordinance is just another step in this important journey. And with that, I would like to welcome Commissioner Escarano uh, to the podium. Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. My name is Rosa Escareño, and I'm the Commissioner for the Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Throughout this pandemic, it's been the essential workers who have uh, primarily led the f uh, effort of reopening our city. And our essential workers are primarily those of color, black and brown, uh, who have been the most impacted uh, during the pandemic. When our city and state shut down a year ago, and we were all told to stay home. It was our essential workers that actually showed up to work and were there to support our essential needs, working at grocery stores, factories, daycares, and other settings. And when we began to reopen last summer, let's not forget that it was our restaurant workers and retail workers, the hairstylists, the drivers, the hotel workers that continue to put themselves at risk uh, to help uh, keep our city open and moving forward in the right direction as we are today. We have an obligation to protect these workers. And under the mayor's leadership, uh, we have worked diligently with many partners to put uh, safeguards in place throughout the pandemic so that the hundreds of thousands of Chicago workers uh, remain um, a priority for this administration. We have strongly enforced COVID-19 regulations, which help to keep employees safe in the workplace. We have moved forward with critical labor laws to guarantee workers an increased minimum wage and a fair schedule. The health department has prioritized essential workers through the vaccine distribution, particularly in the communities hardest hit by the pandemic. And last May, we stood up a landmark anti-retaliation ordinance, which, was, which has prohibited retaliation against employers, I'm sorry, which uh, has prohibited retaliation against employees that take time off if they are sick uh, with COVID or are following the health and quarantine health orders. These were all uh, efforts uh, by Mayor Lightfoot. Today, I am pleased to join Mayor Lightfoot yet again to announce the latest measure to support workers, the Vaccine Anti-Retaliation Ordinance. Under this proposed ordinance, workers that take time off um, to receive the COVID-19 vaccine will be protected from retaliation. This means that an employer cannot fire, demote, implement punitive schedule changes or take any adverse actions against an employee for taking time off to receive the vaccine. Furthermore, if an employee has accrued paid sick time, they are guaranteed the ability to use that time to receive the vaccine. And finally, if an employer requires that uh, their workers 
be vaccinated as part of their employment. The employer must compensate its employees for the time um, for the time it takes to receive the vaccine if it is during a work schedule or, or during work hours. So today we are at a critical juncture in our fight against uh, COVID-19 COVID and we must work together to continue to protect our workers. Especially as the cases have begun to rise again after these cases have been falling consistently for three uh, months consecutively, this rise in cases does cause us pause and concern. And this is why it's so important and imp important for us that on Monday we will be entering phase 1C of the vaccine distribution plan, which will make all of Chicago's essential workers eligible. At this critical time, we need to make sure that employees can get the life-saving vaccine without fear of losing their job or facing any sort of discipline. I am pleased to say that for the, for the most part, our business community and employers have stepped up without, um, throughout this crisis uh, and are doing the right thing and are helping us to protect their workers and keeping the workers safe. I expect that to continue. If not, this ordinance certainly ensures that we have uh, the, the, the mechanisms in place to address it. Um, we need to do everything to continue to support our workers and I want to thank the mayor for her leadership on this matter. And now I'd like to just take a couple of moments to, re, um, to summarize this in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking audience. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Rosa Escareño y soy la comisionada del Departamento de Asuntos Comerciales y Protección al Consumidor. A lo largo de esta pandemia, los trabajadores esenciales de Chicago, uh, principalmente los afroamericanos y latinos, son los que han apoyado el progreso de nuestra ciudad durante la época más oscura de nuestros tiempos. Hoy me complace unirme a, a nuestra alcalde, a Lori Lightfoot, para anunciar la última medida de apoyo a los trabajadores de Chicago. Es una ley que protege a trabajadores contra las represalias de, las vacu de cuando se van a vacunar. Según la legislación propuesta, los trabajadores que tomen tiempo libre para recibir la vacuna COVID-19 estarán protegidos contra represalias. Esto significa que un empleador no puede despedir, degradar, implementar cambios de horario punitivos o tomar acciones adversas contra un empleado, un empleado por tomar tiempo libre para recibir la vacuna. Es más, si un empleado ha acumulado tiempo pagado que cubre su tiempo de enfermedad, se le garantiza la capacidad de usar este tiempo para recibir la vacuna. Y finalmente, si un empleado requiere que sus trabajadores estén vacunados como requisitos de trabajo, este empleador debe compensar a sus empleados por el tiempo que se les toma recibir la vacuna si es durante el tiempo que está trabajando. Estamos en un tiempo crítico en nuestra ciudad contra la lucha uh, que estamos teniendo contra la batalla de COVID. Debemos trabajar unidos para apoyar a todos nuestros trabajadores, especialmente cuando los casos uh, está, han estado aumentando un poco y tenemos que tener mucho cuidado. Uh, este lunes vamos a avanzar a la fase número 1C que, eh, del plan de distribución de vacunas en el, el cual todos los trabajadores esenciales de Chicago serán elegibles. Tenemos que asegurar que los trabajadores de Chicago reciban la vacuna COVID sin temor Uh, de, y de, pueden regresar a su trabajo y también no enfrentar ninguna disciplina. Muchísimas gracias. Now we'll turn it over to the mayor. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Allison Arity, Chicago Department of Public Health. I know a lot of you have questions related to uh, Innovative Care Express, and I thought we would explain some of that right off the bat. So first, to set some context, the Chicago Department of Public Health supplies providers with vaccine both to use for their existing patients and for special projects, which could be Protect Chicago Plus events, they could be employer events like CPS, they could be strike teams. And as you know, our vaccine supply remains very limited. Of the more than six hundred registered vaccination providers in Chicago, the majority of those providers in a given week do not receive any vaccine to give first doses just because vaccine supply doesn't allow it. First, 
We fill all of the second dose needs across Chicago to ensure people get their second doses on time. Second, we allocate vaccine for those special events like Protect Chicago Plus or employer uh, allocations like CPS. And finally, we prioritize first dose allocations to providers in under vaccinated and high vulnerability areas. The Chicago Department of Public Health had not provided any first doses of vaccine to Innovative Express Care in weeks, except for the dedicated vaccine they had received for the CPS special project, which was to be used for CPS employees. And primarily the issue is that we saw ongoing irregularities in Innovative's reporting, requesting, and allocation of vaccine supply, two issues. First, they were using doses that had been allocated for the CPS special project for non-CPS employees. And secondly, they had been misrepresenting their second dose needs, then using those vaccines instead as first doses, including vaccinating in settings that would not be prioritized by CDPH without our knowledge. Obviously, we need to be good stewards of this precious resource. This cannot be tolerated when vaccine supply is so tight. I want to be very clear, there are no safety concerns with the vaccine that was administered. No vaccine was, is, or will be wasted. And everybody who had appointments with Innovative Express will be taken care of, including all CPS personnel. We've already identified new providers to take over and administer vaccine for those who are scheduled to receive a second dose. For CPS personnel with existing vaccine appointments, first or second doses. From tomorrow onward, they will continue to be vaccinated in the exact same CPS site where they would have been with their original appointment, no change to the schedule. And we've worked with people who had vaccine appointments today to ensure that they get scheduled. And then secondly, people who got their first dose through Innovative in the last month outside of CPS will receive their second doses on time. They have already received direct communication from the health department about booking their second doses at a special clinic set up at Truman College. We've already had more than 4,000 people schedule that appointment without any difficulty, but if anyone needs help still rebooking a second dose appointment, you can email modernadoses at cityofchicago.org. That's modernadoses at cityofchicago.org or call our call center at 312-746-7435. Four eight three five. This is only for people who already had a second dose appointment scheduled with Innovative. We know who those folks are and we'll be checking against that list. And just for some context, we of course have done more than a million doses in Chicago in partnership with providers across the city. We continue to hit our goals for efficiency and equity. Overall, it's going great and I want to keep the focus on getting the vaccine out, working with providers who are doing a beautiful job getting vaccine where it is needed in Chicago. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll do a few questions that have come through the pool and then open it up to the folks in the room. Um, Dr. Arwady, Shruti from Bloomberg wants to know what was missing in Chicago's protocols and controls that allowed vaccines from Loretto and those doses intended for CPS employees to go to ineligible individuals? Uh, nothing was missing in our controls. Uh, we have identified all along that where we see issues related to reporting or where we see providers uh, providing vaccine to people who are ineligible, uh, their vaccine supply is at risk and we have cut it off uh, in both of these cases. At any point uh, all along here if, if there have been concerns and we need to put a provider on pause if they're not if they're uh, in any way there's concerns about that we've done that um, and I don't have any concerns about about our controls and in fact you know I take no joy in making these kinds of announcements but they highlight the fact that we are we are really making sure that our vaccine supply is being used appropriately thank you Allison uh, Commissioner Escarino one for you from the Daily Line an ordinance was introduced today supported by 14 aldermen to use $40 million in stimulus money to reimburse bars and restaurants for lost revenue, but Alderman Mitz sent it to Rules Committee. What are your thoughts on this ordinance, and would you support it being discharged so it can get a hearing? Sure. I, I mean, we'd like to really dig into the proposal that was submitted. We certainly uh, understand that uh, many industries across the city have been impacted, and we certainly look forward to working very closely with the various industries to figure out a path forward. We're, we're happy to look into it. Uh, again, we have to dig into some of the numbers that were laid out, which uh, are just not really balancing with, with my, uh, my understanding of the numbers. So thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Mayor, the next two are for you. 
Taman Bradley from WGN is asking, Attorney General Raul is out with his suggestions for CPD search warrant reforms. Among his ideas, clarifying the definition of wrong raid, documenting damage caused by the execution of search warrants, and working with residents to fix the damage. He also recommends using mental health professionals or social workers to assist police with execution of the warrants. Will you add these recommendations to the final search warrant policy <coughs> changes? Um, we will consider the Attorney General's comments along with the other public comments that have been made. And the last one I have through the pool for you, Mayor, is from Bill Cameron. What do you think of Father Flager's desire to resume work in his community before the Archdiocese rules on his case? Well, it's really not for me to weigh in on something like that. The Archdiocese um, has a very specific process. I can certainly appreciate uh, Father Flager's uh, impatience. Um, he has a great passion for his community, uh, which is to his credit. Um, but I'm going to stay where I should be, which is to let the archdiocese process play itself out. There have been years past where the archdiocese, I think, has rightfully been criticized uh, for not taking these kinds of allegations seriously. They've done a complete turnaround, and that process needs to be followed and given time to uh, work itself out. Okay. <coughs> The man with the microphone gets to speak first. Uh, uh, today the council passed a resolution um, bringing to the table the possibility of approving a uh, universal basic <coughs> income uh, pilot program. Uh, would you support something like that? Well, look, I, I think what you're seeing with that and some other um, uh, uh, items coming out of City Council is a recognition of what we all know, which is that our residents have been extraordinarily hard hit. Many were suffering pre-COVID, their suffering has been exacerbated, and there's a whole new legion of people who have been hard hit eco economically as a result of COVID. I think it's important for us to recognize that and then come together and think about what are the most effective ways in the long term to make sure that we give people the ability to take care of themselves and their families and their communities. Um, I favor jobs. I think that on the, in the long term, building a strong, robust, and inclusive economy that, in, that deals people in from all across the city is the best way that we can cure some of the economic woes that folks are facing. So we'll have that conversation as uh, things proceed. Say it again? Does that mean you don't support No, what I said is that I think there's a lot of proposals that um, have been put forward and others that will be uh, put forward, and we've got to have a robust debate. But my focus is on making sure that we change the economic fortunes of people permanently and not, on a, not just on a temporary basis. I think the best way to do that is through economic development and getting people jobs and putting them back to work. Mayor, um, can you just weigh in? Do you, do you have concerns about just the, the oversight of this vaccine use? I mean, first of all, we had the Loretto situation. Now we've got here. Is there Are there other problems out there? And, and does there need to be additional oversight? Well, I think we have ro very robust oversight. Um, and what we're talking about is medical professionals that have a license um, that has been vetted and approved by the state. We have a right to expect and per our contract, that people abide by the rules and that they, they give us accurate uh, reporting. And what we've seen in at least two instances, that hasn't been the case. And when that doesn't happen, we obviously start with a conversation with a provider. We point out the things that we see, um, and we see that because of our oversight, and we give them an opportunity to get it right. When we see um, instances where they're not um, making the changes that are necessary to comply with uh, the protocols, comply with the expectations uh, that we set for every single provider who has the privilege of getting this very scarce life-saving resource when they're demonstrating to us that they're not going to play by the rules and they're not going to give us accurate reporting, then we have to take um, very swift action and that's exactly what we've done. Thanks. Got questions on two topics. What do you make of the failure of the council to pass Alderman Haddon's resolution concerning India and the caste and religious violence there? Uh, furthermore, would say the last part? The caste and religious violence there. 
Well, uh, look, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be an expert on what's happening uh, in India, the world's largest um, democracy. And I think what you heard a lot today is, one, concern about what is going on in the ground, but also a recognition that many members of the council felt uncomfortable because they don't know all the ins and outs of what's going on um, there uh, on the ground in India. Obviously, um, we have concerns any places where um, uh, people's uh, God-given rights are being suppressed, where there's um, state-sponsored um, violence. Um, but I think what you saw was um, a reluctance on the part of the city council to weigh in on an issue so far away that many didn't feel like they had enough information about, um, particularly in light of the fact that there are so many pressing issues um, here in Chicago. I'm sure there'll be other instances uh, where um, uh, members of the council um, are going to want to weigh in on um, a range of issues that are going on in other countries, but also we need to make sure that we're not out ahead of uh, the Biden administration, who in the first instance has, I think, the, the primary responsibility for really setting the nation's uh, views on foreign policy uh, matters. But there's a lot of hot spots across the country, across the world, I should say, that we get reporting on, but it doesn't mean that we know with the level of precision um, that others do, what's actually happening on the ground there. What do you think as a politician and as a small d Democrat about the Modi government's conduct towards Muslims look, in I, India? I, look, I, I, what I say sitting here as the mayor of Chicago uh -huh. is I'm not going to get ahead of the Biden administration. Um, I, my expectation is that the federal administration is engaging across the globe on issues of human rights um, and where we see the government either turning a blind eye um, or not taking appropriate action or worse, being themselves engaged in uh, violence. Um, for example, like what's going on in uh, Myanmar, I, I read about that every day. I am horrified, horrified what the military junta is doing um, to citizens who are simply out in the street expressing themselves and now pushing almost 300 people killed um, in that country because they have the audacity to want uh, democratic uh, rule over and self-determination over themselves. So there's, I have a lot of personal opinions about a lot of things going on across the world, but I also, in the first instance, want to defer to the federal administration, um, who I have great confidence in, are not going to be bystanders when we see um, acts of uh, violence um, compromising democratic principles um, or other atrocities across the world. And secondly, um, is there any update that you've got regarding the introduction of your police accountability ordinance? We're working on it. And I wondered if you had any uh, comment about the Empowering Communities for Public Safety ordinance that was put forth by GAPA and CPAC, uh, whether you'd let it come up for a hearing in I'm the not, public I'm safety I'm not sure that I have seen the final version. I've heard a lot about conversations that are going on, but I don't believe that I've seen um, what the latest iteration of the ordinance. There's been a lot of different versions that have been put forward over the last couple months, but we are working uh, to get to a place where I'm hopeful uh, that we will uh, take a vote in the near term on civilian oversight of the police. Thank you. I'm Mayor Eric Hong with ABC7. Uh, regarding innovative, uh, th they, I think, suggested that it, this was simple miscommunication. No, regarding absolutely false. Uh, absolutely false. I know that that's what they're saying. That's absolutely false. Obviously, we don't take um, um, uh, taking uh, vaccine access away from any provider lightly. As I said, there's an iterative process that we go through. But there were two problems there. One, using vaccine that was intended for one use for something over here that was completely unauthorized. That can't happen. And number two, giving us in repeated inaccurate reporting about the usage. We communicated with them extensively about what was going on. And it's clear, frankly, from their own admissions that they were not following the rules. And so, yeah, they're, they're going to say a lot of things, I suspect, um, yesterday, today, tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is, we gave them every opportunity to get right with what the rules and responsibilities are for every provider who has the privilege of getting access to the vaccine, and they repeatedly failed to hold up their end of the bargain. And so now they're dealing with the consequences of those actions. Did they specifically ask for more second doses than they needed in order to redirect those to first doses? Specific. Well, I can't, I can't opine about their motive, but they absolutely asked for more second doses that were inconsistent with the number of first doses that they got. That was a problem.
All right, last one. Yeah, just want to, uh, Mayor, if you could weigh in on Dr. Arwady's comments yesterday regarding the uptick and rise in cases, mm -hmm. how concerned you are, and, and what does this mean for the potential for reopening the city in the coming weeks? I'm very concerned. Um, if you look at our data in the last week to 10 days, it feels like October, when we saw the second surge happen. The, where we should be at this point in the arc of the virus is cases going down, not up. We've seen a significant uptick in the number of daily cases just over the last week, which is definitely concerning. Equally concerning is the increase in our percent positivity. Not that long ago, within the last couple of weeks, we had uh, percent positivity that was the lowest that we've seen through the pandemic. Now we're back up uh, in a way that is definitely concerning. We're monitoring the uptick in the number of hospitalizations and ICU beds. So there, we are definitely concerned. We're not in a position as a result of that to really be talking about any more reopening issues, particularly when it comes to expanding capacity indoors. The last thing that any of us want to do is take any steps back. But we are, we are in um, a place where both Dr. Arity and myself are very concerned and we're sounding the alarm. We're seeing an increase in cases in the um, demographic, age demographic of 18 to 39 year old across all races and ethnicities. That is very, very concerning. So we'll be coming out with some additional guidance in the coming days, but we're concerned. We're not in a place where we should be, which is cases continuing to go down. We saw the case is going down very, very nicely um, in February and early March. Then we saw a little bit of plateauing, which we were watching very closely. And unfortunately, as you know, and as reported on a daily basis, we're now seeing an uptick in those cases. That's concerning because we're going in the wrong direction. All right, thanks, Mayor. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.